Welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram. This is, let's see, episode 46, recorded on April 24th, 2013. If you want to see all of our episodes, you can go to walkinpark.com, my blog. Okay, so this week we are going to Texas, to three different locations in Texas, as a matter of fact. Took a trip to Texas this month and uh, went to Southwest Texas um, and uh, to the Big Bend area, Big Bend National Park, right on the Rio Grande River. And I also uh, went to a place called Fort Stockton, historic Fort Stockton. And finally, I went to uh, the hill country of Texas, west of San Antonio, to a park there for a little while. So uh, we will uh, check that out. Actually, why don't we get right to it? We'll start the story here. I'll go to this transition image of a blooming cactus here. If I can get it up, there we go. And uh, switch over to our Well, hello. Uh, I am in Texas, in South Llano River State Park in Junction, Texas, which is a little over 100 miles west of San Antonio in the Texas Hill Country. Very arid, scrubby, slow trees. Not really desert, but an arid region of uh, eroded landscape where rivers have eroded basically off the high Great Plains heading down towards the Gulf of Mexico and uh, this is a beautiful place. I've been here a few days. Um, it's particularly a um, popular birding hotspot. Lots of people come here to watch birds because there, I guess there are maybe as many as three flyways that kind of converge here, especially during migration, I guess. So lots of different species come through here, and as we'll see later, there are blinds and so forth we can look at. In any case, uh, this is where I first stopped when I came to uh, Texas, uh, flew to San Antonio last week, and uh, my goal was to go to Big Bend National Park in southwest Texas along the Rio Grande River in the Chisos Mountains. But um, it's a, a long drive, it's several hundred miles, and it's one of the most remote national parks. And uh, it's hard to get a place to stay anywhere near the park unless you're going to camp in the park or stay in the lodge there, which is booked up many months in advance. And it's extremely uh, dry and uh, sort of rugged country. So anyway, uh, for many years I had wanted to go to Big Bend and uh, I took this opportunity. April is a great month for it because uh, it's warming up. Uh, spring break is over, so the college students are, are going back to school. and. Uh, uh, the birds are migrating, the days are getting longer, and uh, it's uh, not it's too hot yet either. So so anyway, I flew to San Antonio, and I stayed overnight there in a hotel, and I drove west, and I was feeling kind of tired from my trip and didn't have a good night in San Antonio, and I stopped at this state park, and I said, oh, this is a nice place. Uh, maybe I'll come back here on the way back. And, uh, and then the next day I went on, to uh, as close to the um, national park as I could get in a town. And I stopped in this little town called Marathon along a, along a uh, freight train route about 70 miles north of Big Bend National Park. And I stayed, I, I brought my tent in my luggage and camping gear, all in luggage, brought a lot of luggage, <coughs> excuse me. And so I set up my tent in this nice RV park. They had a nice tenting area. It really was quite nice and um, you know went to sleep and lo and behold there are um, freight trains that come through all day all night and five different freight trains came through just across the street blaring their horns as they come to cross the uh, the intersection across the road that crosses the, the tracks so all hours of the night the trains are coming through blaring their horns i don't know whether i got two and a half or three hours sleep that night in any case, it was a bad night for me. And combine that with my tender eastern lungs that are not too used to the extremely dry, dusty climate that was there. And I was feeling horrible the next morning. And I said, I've got to get out of here. And I very much doubted my ability to uh, camp in the 
eight or nine degrees, uh, nine uh, percent, eight or nine percent humidity in uh, Big Bend National Park, which I was uh, concerned about. So uh, I retreated to a um, larger town called Fort Stockton, which was uh, about 60 miles north of Marathon. The whole thing is about, about 125 miles from Big Bend National Park, so quite a ways from my goal. And I went up there and I stayed there for a couple of days, sort of recuperating and uh, thinking like, ah, I'm not gonna make it to Big Bend. Um, my health wasn't doing real great. And uh, so I, but I decided to, uh, if I was given lemons, I'd make lemonade. And I went and looked at uh, Fort's, historic Fort Stockton. Turns out to be a very interesting place. There are some remnants of, uh, of a 19th century um, frontier military outpost there that was built before, originally, the original version of it was built before um, the Civil War. And I think it was 1858, and uh, it was, at a place originally called Comanche Springs because Comanches would come south and stop here at this ar huge artesian spring that started a creek there and they would water there on there on uh, going south they said to conduct raids in Mexico and so uh, 1849 I guess was the uh, the gold rush in California so this was the along the southernmost route of the um, pioneers heading west to California for the gold rush and uh, it was the only one you could really do in winter so um, the, the Comanches and the Apaches and so forth were seeing all these settlers coming through invading their territory so of course they defended their territory and they attacked them so then the army sent out and built this post there was another one farther west at uh, Fort Davis this was in between two forts and there wasn't enough um, it was too far a distance between Fort Davis and another fort further east to uh, uh, cover the area and protect the area for the, uh, the wagon trains and so forth. So uh, Fort Stockton was created in, a, uh, in an army outpost there. And then, but that was 1858 and 1861 was the Civil War. And the, uh, of course, Texas uh, seceded from the Union along with uh, the rest of the Confederate States and the general that was running Fort Stockton at the time, or the officer, he, he uh, sided with the South and all the Union soldiers headed north. And Fort Stockton was, uh, I guess, um, uh, had uh, Confederate troops in it for a short while, but then they gave it up and it just fell into ruin. And then after the Civil War, um, the uh, U.S. government decided to reestablish Fort Stockton in a new location, not far from the original one, and they built the adobe and limestone buildings, and some of them still remain, and some others have been reconstructed. And it's a uh, it's a historic site that's owned by the city of Fort Stockton, and a uh, very interesting place. So one of the most interesting things about historic Fort Stockton is um, that it was um, manned primarily by what were called Buffalo Soldiers, that is African American regiment. Uh, two of them, the 9th and 10th, I believe it was, that um, uh, had, there, were, there were black uh, regiments in the Union Army. And after the war, uh, this continued. They were still segregated from white reg regiments. But uh, there were a lot of young men who had been slaves that had been liberated by the, by the um, Civil War. And uh, so many of them joined the Army. And this is about the only way they knew how to survive was to join the army. So, so uh, under the um, uh, rule of uh, white officers, uh, they came out and uh, established, reestablished Fort Stockton, and uh, then carried out a uh, war against the Comanches and the Apaches and so forth uh, to the west, and eventually pacified the area and went after the. Um, the last of the of the uh, war parties that would eventually, you know, come in and carry out guerrilla attacks on on settlements and wagon trains and forts and what have you. So uh, these Buffalo soldiers uh, played a role in the conquest of the West in for about 20 years. Uh, it was yeah, about 20 years the fort was there, and then finally after there was no longer an Indian problem, uh, the um, 
the soldiers left and the, and the fort um, was no longer used. And then sometime during the 20th century, it was, uh, was um, made into a historic site. And of course, a town had built up around the fort during these 20 years or so and uh, of people servicing the fort and so whatever. And those people stayed and created the, the city of Fort Stockton. And uh, it still is, it's on Interstate 10 now. Uh, and it was, of course, established around a water route um, that um, water is very important here in the West. And so everywhere there was a place for water, um, a spring or a river or something like that, that's where people had to go. So uh, water was the, was the Comanche Springs were the um, reason for the creation of Fort Stockton. Um, other than the fort, it's not a particularly interesting or appealing place. There's a local museum and um, not much around there. So I just stayed there a couple of days and, and uh, regrouped. And then I started feeling good and I said, dang, I'm going to go down to Big Bend after all. After all, I got up early in the morning and I drove south to Marathon, had breakfast, drove the next 70 miles down to the park. And then I had a whole afternoon, a whole afternoon, a few, five hours or so in Big Bend, I got up into Chisos Basin and all the high rocky mountains all around me and uh, uh, I actually went for a hike. Uh, I went on what was called the Lost Mine Trail that gets up to this incredible ridge and you climb up through all different kinds of uh, vegetation. Some of it only uh, uh, is the only place in the U.S. that it grows like the Mexican juniper and so forth and there was lots of cactus and stuff. This is not desert, this is mountain, dry mountain forest. The desert is in the lowlands around the mountains. And um, I did get, eventually get back there, but <coughs> my uh, gold had to get to Chisos Basin, which uh, has a, a lodge and a, a restaurant and everything very modestly presented there. It's, it's uh, quite um, unobtrusively uh, established. I've been there for a while. In fact, the Civilian Conservation Corps um, uh, established much of the uh, works that are there now back in the 1930s, early 1940s, and so there was an interpretive sign for that. So I, I looked from afar at the campground that I was thinking of staying in. And I was doing fine with the dry air during the day, but I could tell that if I stayed in that campground for a week, I think I'd just dry right out. So uh, I have problems with the uh, dry air affecting my lungs and so forth. When I was young, I could go live and work in the desert, hike in the desert, and uh, spend some time in the Grand Canyon and so forth. And, uh, but now it's a little bit harder for me. So, um, But I did get to Big Bend. I had despaired of it. I would, when I was at Fort Stockton, at the historic fort, I was kind of uh, weeping. I said, oh man, I'm not gonna make it to Big Bend, my great dream. But then I did, and I made it to Big Bend for a day. And it was, it was spectacular, it was beautiful. Uh, Amazing plants. One of the one of the plants that I saw that got me excited was the uh, ocotillo, which is a um, uh, I don't know what family of plants it's in, but it's an arid desert plant, tall, spiny stems, and it was blooming in these these uh, um, arms of uh, flowers reaching out from the ends of the stems, and that's all that's on it. And then eventually, when it rains, I guess the little tiny um, leaves come just out of the stem. There really aren't any side twigs or anything. But it, it was just the uh, the blooms, the blossoms, um, the inflorescences, whatever you want to call them, that were visible then. And that was great. So I took a few pictures of that and uh, some of the other um, yucca plants and cactus and so forth, including some barrel cactus up on top of uh, the ridge uh, on the Lost Mine Trail. I only went up a mile to the first big look. You could go on much farther and get incredible views down the canyons and so forth. But uh, that Lost Mine Trail, that was pretty cool. But uh, that was there was this little barrel cactus there that was blooming. And then some other cactuses, uh, prickly pear had signs that some of it was blooming. So there were a lot of things uh, blooming in the desert. Uh, uh, not that the desert is a place that's covered with flowers all the time, but sometimes it is, and especially when there's been some rain. So um, you know, interestingly, I had um, uh, signs up warning you about the um, uh, bears and mountain lions and on this one trail they had both signs up you know saying that they've been seen in the area someone told me that there was a um, I think it was a ranger told me that there was a mother bear and three or four cubs seen in that area so 
Anyway, just warning you what to do or what not to do in the presence of these animals. And uh, um, not that people are attacked frequently, but it's not impossible. So, so that kind of makes it kind of exciting that there are these wild animals out there, large wild animals, especially the, the lions, and uh, which are are known from time to time to attack people, especially if they're hungry and small children. You've got to watch out for them. But uh, um, yeah, it didn't happen very often. Um, so uh, Big Bend was beautiful. I got to see just the taste of it that I wanted to see. I got myself a hat and uh, Big Bend National Park hat. And um, then I had to leave. Uh, I, I wasn't, you can't, there isn't outside the park like when I went to Rocky Mountain National Park uh, a few years ago. And right outside the park is a town called Estes Park that many people know. And, it's built up around people visiting the park. And you know, that's sort of a mixed thing because they become kind of tourist towns. They can put a lot of pressure on the, on the natural landscape. But they are also a place that people can stay and, and get close to the park and find lodging and food and so forth if they're not going to camp. And not everybody can camp or wants to camp. And um, there's nothing like that at Big Bend because um, the, it's, I presume, because there's not much water there and there's just no place to have a um, associated community uh, anywhere near the park. So the closest is maybe 70 miles away. So unless you're camping there, you have an RV, you're staying down by the Rio Grande at what they call Rio Grande Village or something like that, or, um, or you're staying in the lodge, which, as I said, takes, uh, you have to reserve many months in advance. Um, you uh it's not that easy to get to it's one of the more remote national parks but it's it's a fine one it's a fine one so i guess i can check that off my list at least nominally and i did get to see get to see it some and uh it was fun it was great um and uh i don't know if i'll ever go back but i know i've been there Okay, so uh, that was the first part of my trip here, and then uh, now why don't we just go right into the second part again, where I go east towards the, um, back towards San Antonio, I get to within like, well, a little over 100 miles from San Antonio at South Llano River State Park. So we'll go to there, right back into part two here. Hang on. Since uh, staying at uh, Big Bend uh, didn't work out for me, um, I sort of reversed the priorities of my trip. And the uh, South Llano River State Park that I'd stopped in when I first uh, uh, headed west from San Antonio, and I thought that I'd stop in again on the way back perhaps, um, turned out to be where I'd spend the, the larger part of the time. And I came here and I spent four nights. Uh, uh, came here Monday and I'm leaving on Friday and uh, camping in a, an RV campground. There's electric and water. Well, I just have a tent, although I sometimes have used the, definitely use the water and even use the electric a little bit for charging up devices like this camera. Um, and uh, get to know some of the folks in the RV camp. And a lot of the people that come here are birders because as I, uh, because it's a um, burning hotspot and um, uh, several uh, flyways of migrating birds particularly come through this area. They kind of converge here around this river and I guess they stop and feed and water and rest and so forth on the way north. Plus there are many resident birds that are just known to this part of the country in central and western Texas and southern Texas and so forth that you see here nowhere else. Um, and so they have, I don't know, maybe it's many as five, four or five um, observation blinds, little booths you go in that, uh, where they've put water supply out and feeders and such. And you see all these amazing birds and all these birders, bird watchers show up and we chat, they're all friendly. We share each other's observations there and share knowledge and so forth. They have a bird guide there you can look at and, and uh, that's a chain to the place. And it's really nice setup. And um, so 
a lot of birders and ran into a lot of bird, bird watchers here. Of course, it's uh, not during a sort of vacation time, so mostly the folks here are retired. And there are, as I said, lots of RVs, RV camp. And uh, I made some friends and, uh, you know, hung out with people. And people told me a lot, learned a lot. And I saw a lot of birds that I hadn't seen before. Uh, the, probably the most uh, prized one to see here, perhaps, is the painted bunting, which is this colorful bird. It has a blue head, an orange breast, and a green back. I even took a couple of pictures of it. And, and uh, I hadn't seen one for the first three days and was hoping to see one. And then this afternoon, I went to one blind, and uh, uh, there were like five of them there. And uh, so I, I got to see them. And some others, a lesser goldfinch, which is yellow on the bottom and black on its back and head, and which is only down here. You never see it farther north. And uh, quite a few other birds that... Uh, uh, I hadn't seen before, so uh, so it was a great place. I saw almost every every time I went out, I saw a bird I had never seen before. And you know, I'm a moderate birder, a casual birder, but I know a lot of birds, and up north. And uh, so this was a great opportunity to sort of get back into birding and just amazingly see new stuff. So that was fun. And the landscape here, as you can see, some of the plants around here are pretty. Um, uh, uh, severe looking thorny uh, well they're just starting to leaf out it's spring spring's a little late here they tell me and and some of them are, are evergreen but there's a, uh, lots of cactus and and yucca type plants and other plants that have thorns on them that that are trying to resist the browsing of uh, herbivores um, oh this park interestingly also is a turkey refuge is a wildlife management area associated with it and they have some what they call turkey roost areas and the winter I guess the turkeys congregate and uh, they're very sensitive in terms of their uh, turkey roosting area habitat requirements and don't take well to um, disturbance. So they, from the fall into the spring through the winter, they restrict the hours of the day that you can go into these areas. And uh, so the turkeys are not disturbed and they will stay here. And uh, of course up north we don't think about the turkeys that much other than that they're there and they're all over the place and uh, we don't have special preserves for them, but here they do. So that's a, actually a major thing. And I've seen a number of the turkeys, and I've seen some deer, and I was told that the deer that I see that are in the park here are not white-tailed deer. They're not the native deer. They're axis deer, which are from Eurasia, I guess. I don't know exactly where. And, and uh, um, there, are, there are some wildlife uh, game parks, I guess, some people have set up and brought exotic game here and some of them inevitably escape so you see these axis deer going around and I guess they're pushing out the white tails but uh, at least in this area I'm not sure there'll be much of a problem beyond here but uh, uh, there's quite a few of them in the park and uh, they do a lot of browsing and so forth so uh, and I walked down the bottom bottomland forest uh, along the river um, uh, of pecans I always call them pecans but I was uh, I told they were called pecans, big pecan trees there, uh, uh, a forest of them, wild pecans. And, and I was told that the wild pecans are actually used to uh, graft on the soft shells pecans. The wild pecans are very hard shells, and the squirrels are about the only thing you can eat them. And um, uh, they graft, people graft on uh, branches of the um, soft shell pecan, which we, you know, we eat, onto the, the uh, um, the stems and the trunks and so forth of the um, wild pecans. So that was interesting. Um, also, there's another tree there called a um, cedar elm. It has cedar-like bark, but it's actually an elm tree with little elm leaves, and that's kind of neat. And that was part of this bottom land forest. And then a host of other kinds of trees and so forth around here that uh, they have little interpretive uh, uh, signs that are covered over. You lift them up and you can learn about the tree and so forth. So that's kind of neat too. So you can learn about you can learn about the uh, plant life here as well, and then a lot of cactus growing in and yuccas of various sort. So uh, pretty neat. A lot of rattlesnakes in the area. I've seen only seen one, um, but um, I was. They tell you in the at least in the national parks like Big Bend and and I remember I was in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument on the border with Mexico, Southwest Arizona many years ago and. 
they tell you when you come back from the campground program after dark in the campground, have a flashlight because the, uh, <clears throat> the snakes will cross the road. The rattlesnakes come out at uh, late in the day and after dark and they're out hunting then for mice and so forth. And, and um, uh, so I had seen that at Big Bend and so I had to walk to the, uh, the restroom through the campground road and I had my flashlight and I was sort of casually, I hadn't seen any warnings about this here, casually looking around on the way back. And, you know, I, I should do this, but I don't think I'll see anything. Well, there was a snake. It was only about, you know, less than a foot long. Maybe it was a foot long, I don't know. And it was slowly sliding across the And I looked at it and I said, my goodness, that's a rattlesnake. And I went back and looked at my desert natural history book, and indeed it is was a small western diamondback rattler, which is uh, one of the most venomous snakes in North America. So um, there wasn't any problem with it. It kept going its way. I think it was kind of paralyzed by my flashlight. But <coughs> excuse me. So you have to keep your eyes out. And as some person, one person said, well, when you're birding, you're looking up, but you really need to look down at your feet. Um, for the snakes, so, so especially late in the day, which is starting to get um, the uh, the snakes do come out. But that's the only one I've seen, and it was a little one. Probably wouldn't have hurt me too bad. But uh, I was wearing sneakers. Then put on my boots for uh, hiking, though. Anywhere else? So South Llano River State Park is really a nice place. Uh, you're in Central Texas, <coughs> San Antonio area, you may want to stop over here and stay a couple of days and bring your binoculars. And people go on the river, people float, uh, uh, they tube down the river. There's a lot of kayakers come through here. They come to the park and then they kayak on the river and people wade in the river and so forth. I don't, there's no formal swimming area, but uh, people go in the water. Um, I hadn't done it. We did have some very hot days here, but today is only in the 60s, low 60s. A front came through and rattled my tent and uh, rained on it and so forth, but I was fine. And um, so it's cool now. It's supposed to be a chilly night down in the upper 30s. So I've seen temperatures in the 30s and I've seen temperatures in the 90s. So in the spring you get quite a variety. And of course I haven't had the blizzards that they've had up north in the Rockies and the in the in the plains and so forth. So in the upper upper Midwest. So that's nice. Glad to be down here. But going home soon to. The Sunny Finger Lakes, looking forward to it. Well, so that was my trip to uh, Texas and um, don't know if I'll get back there again anytime soon. I'm kind of looking at some other parts of the country, but uh, some of my Spanish speaking friends will say, see that double L on South Llano River State Park, and I had to get used to it myself because I speak a little Spanish. And uh, of course, in Spanish, a double L is pronounced like a Y or an SH, so they might say South Llano River. That's what I found myself saying. You think of the word llama, spelled with a double L on South America, they say llama or llama. So uh, anyway, uh, there's an anglicization, you know, Detroit is not Detroit, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, Anyway, we're uh, running out of time here, so I thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll uh, see you next time.